Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Keeping It Real Estate Show. Today, we welcome on the show Rich Fetke. Rich is a licensed real estate broker, active investor, and co-founder of Real Wealth, which is a real estate investment group that helps its 60,000 plus members improve their financial knowledge and secure passive income to obtain financial freedom. Rich's work has been featured on TV, radio, and in print, including USA Today, Entrepreneur Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. Rich Fetke is the author of The Wise Investor, which is a modern parable about creating financial freedom and living your best life. So with that, Rich, welcome to the show. And to start off, I, I know Kathy because we've met at some previous real estate investing events. And the piece that stood out with me about you, Rich, was X Games background. I have an X Games background. Maybe let's start right. with that real quick. What What did you do at X Games as the first X Games event? Oh, it was, yeah, it was 1995 in Providence, Rhode Island. And I was in the bungee jumping competition, which is like a high diving competition. You know how many flips you can get off the, off the platform and off a 160-foot crane. So it was a blast. I love that. Did you ever get paid to bungee jump or was it just out of passion and love? No, we did a, a show for ESPN, like a bungee jump off up in Northern California. Um, and so we got a little bit from that, but you know, not, not the big bucks like you earned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's get into some of this real estate talk. I want to talk about your book right out of the gate. It's called the wise investor, you know, and in an overview for the lister listener, what is it about? And, and why did you write it? Oh uh, yeah, I'll hold it up for the video here. I know people are just listening on audio, but that's the, they say I'm supposed to hold a book cover up here. <laughs> so wise investor, it's really um over the last 25 years, you know, for 27 years I've been a business and personal coach. I got certified way back when in 95 about the same time as the, the X Games, and then Kathy and I started Real Wealth helping people invest in real estate in 2003. And so, and I had a book come out in 2002 that was called Extreme Success, relating extreme sports to business and life. And so it's been 20 years since I wrote a book. And the reason I wrote a parable was because I wanted to kind of wrap all this wisdom and knowledge that I've gained as a coach working with clients, but also from interviewing the people in our network on what they did to create financial freedom, where they were, what they did and where they are now. And so interviewing people and on our podcast, it's just like, wow, there's so many lessons to be shared and so much important knowledge around creating financial independence um, that I wanted to write another book, basically. Uh, but I wanted a book that people would finish that would be a page turner. So that's why I wrote a parable. I wanted something that would be a story, compelling story that would create an emotional change for people. So that's why that's why the the parable, the story. I, I love that. So there are a ton of financial and investing books out there. How would you say yours is different for the listener? It's more of a um, mindset shifter. So it definitely gives tools and you know how to invest, how to get started, the savings to invest plan. Uh, it tells a story of this guy who's a hard worker. He's making a good six figures, maxing out his 401k. He's got a wife, a couple kids, but he has no time for his life, for his family. And so he's really struggling. And then he meets a mentor who shows him a new path to creating financial freedom. And this guy, he becomes wealthy in more ways than he thought possible. So he learns about becoming his best self, being a better dad, being a better husband. Uh, and in the meantime, learning a lot about how to invest, how to stop letting his lifestyle creep take over financially. Uh, so yeah, lots of lessons oh. on that. So that's how it's different than you know, than the other nonfiction financial books, which are awesome. And I've learned a ton from, I've wanted something that would uh, really have people take action. Honestly, as a coach, I love to see people take action. So I wanted a story that would have people like, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to shift my life and, and see wealth in a new way. I love that. And, and what I really love about it, Rich, is that I think a lot of folks think as they're growing up, once you get to that six figure or, or even a, a lower, higher six figure number that you've made it. And I think mm. sometimes you get a little bit tricked where you're like, I'm here and I don't have any time and I'm very controlled. And maybe you've had and have created some poor spending habits and now you're maxing out your income and you just, in order to maintain, you have to work. You're literally a slave to the job. So I think totally. I'm excited to read this book and, and get that perspective. You know, and in, in the book, why does the mentor, you know, in the story prefer real estate as his main investment focus? Is there exact reason for that? 
because it's the best investment vehicle out there. <laughs> That's my opinion. Um, but it's just, you know, learning so much over the last 20 years running our company and being investors ourselves. Uh, Kathy and I have really seen that, you know, we invest in the stock market. Um, we have gold, we, you know, do, do all that. We've had mutual funds and everything, but real estate is what has had us be millionaires. <laughs> and we've seen a lot of millionaires created for it from that. And beyond that, more important than being a millionaire is that monthly cash flow, being able to have that money come in, that mailbox money, if you will, that comes in on a regular basis. So then you can live life on your own terms, you know, not a slave to the job, not working 60 hours a week, but having that money come in, you know, it's it's what you guys preach and what you guys do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's what it's what drew me to real estate investing. You know, during my snowboarding career, I, I had this realization. I was riding on a chairlift. I still remember where I was at Mount Hood. I nice. realized that if I stop riding, I stop getting paid. The only way I get paid is if I ride. And luckily, I loved the snowboarding. It was a passion. But still, the reality was, is if I took three months off or six months off, and I just told these brands that, yeah, I'm just taking a little time off. Or you that, got injured. Or you got injured. Thank you. Wow. Yes. You're, you're, you're pretty much fired and now you're back to square one. And that's where mm -hmm. passive and in, in income, real estate investment, as long as you're buying right, you got the right debt, you got a great team, you're in a great market, you got great asset management, you should be able to have residual income coming in, whether you work or don't work. I saw, so I'm, I'm right there with you. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote it for, um, have you heard the term Henry's? Henry's. No, I have not. Henry's. Yeah. It's something I just heard about it maybe a, almost a year ago now, but it's high earners, not rich yet. Uh, so those are the people out there. They're making a high income. They're off, you know, busy professionals, um, but they're not rich. They're making a lot of money, but they don't have the wealth and they don't have that monthly cash flow. So a lot of this, the wise investor was directed at the Henry's to show them a new way to invest in, in exactly what you're talking about there, being able to have residual income. What, yeah, and what I like you said there, they're rich, is they're not rich yet. It's you can, still, you can still do it. Like, oh, I'm down this path. I have this high six figure income. That's a great position to be in. What do you right. changes? What slight changes do you need to make every month to get you on a path towards freedom? So you can choose to work or not work. Work. So that's that's awesome. I love it. Amen. <laughs> yeah. One thing you talk about is real wealth. You know what? What do you mean by that? Real wealth. I mean, that's why we called our company Real Wealth, because it's more than just money. It's about having the money, but also the freedom to live life on your own terms, to be able to do what you want with the people you want to be with, when you want to do it, you know, that that is real wealth. So there's, you know, I live in Malibu, California, and there's a lot of money here. There's a lot of rich people. Some of the rich people are stoked and happy, and they're making a big difference and living life. And then some of the rich people here are grumpy and miserable and they have, you know, broken marriages and they don't treat their kids well. You know, my daughter went to Malibu High, so she got to really see that firsthand when she'd go for friends' houses and she'd come home and, you know, it was funny. One day she came home, she said, how many, how many houses do we own? And we're like, why? She said, because my friend owns five houses. And I'm like, well, those are different houses on, <laughs> we own little, little, little apartments and uh, single family homes, you know? <laughs> so I love funny. it. But that, that's the difference in real wealth. It's really real wealth is holistic. It's being able to, you know, take good care of your relationships and your health and have the time and the freedom and just to be stoked on life and to have the money to do that. Gosh, Rich, I, you're, you're speaking my language. You know what? Mm. Growing up as a kid, I always thought, and I saw the people who were rich, they had these big homes, these nice cars. But a lot of times the kids that I would get to know, the friends that were my friends, they seemed angry and sad and, yeah. and, and, and something was missing, you know? And right. I, I think that that's a piece for people who do do well financially. How can you make it a holistic thing? How can you make it the family thing and not just about the car and, and the home? Because I can tell you from what I've seen personally and what I'm seeing as I get to know more folks like you're talking about, it isn't just money. Money won't do it. You, there, there's so much more to it. So many of us seem to encounter fear and negativity when it comes to our financial future and even our goals. Sounds like you have some strategies for getting through tougher situations. Can you tell us more about those strategies? 
For sure. I bet you use very similar ones as an uh, adventure athlete because it's that's where I learned it is, you know, doing adventure sports from skydiving to bungee jumping, skiing. Um, it's how to deal with that fear. And so often, and I learned uh, working with clients as a coach, uh, I really came up with this process for actually uh, identifying your fear and befriending your fear. So many people resist it, or you hear this, you know, stare fear in the face and fight it down or ignore it. It's, it, you just can't win, you know, you have to embrace it. So there's something, uh, what I think, especially when it comes to finances is to really just check in with that fear and say, Hey, this is my big goal. This is what I want. This is what's important to me. Is there anything, any concerns that you have? And it's amazing when you just kind of close your eyes and take a couple deep breaths and you check in with your subconscious and that fear, that fear will actually give you some answers. It'll say, I need you to learn about this, or I need you, you need to connect with this type of person, all these different things. So instead of like, you know, our fear has been our protector, right? Ever since we were born, it's been there to protect us from failure, from, from pain, from embarrassment, from ridicule. It does all these things to protect us. So, but then you get older and often it overprotects. It's, it's thinks its job is always to look for the problem and all that. So it's always pointing out the problems. So checking in with it and saying, what do you need? The fear will subside. I'll say, okay, you're listening to me. And then you can actually look at potential obstacles and then come up with a game plan for those potential obstacles as you move forward toward, you know, creating your financial freedom or whatever it might be. Gosh, that's so big. You know, your fear is really a guide. It's it's something to help you make changes and, and it doesn't mean you stop and, and move away. And I think that was something in my snowboarding career, like you like you're just describing, Rich. We I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis every single spot we hit. And even a lot of the deals we buy, there is some fear, you know, like there, you, the, nothing is certain, but you have to move forward with a team, with your crew and take some of those risks and make adjustments, course corrections along the way. So um, I think that that's a huge piece for a lot of folks to think about. And I'm, I'm thinking about with my kids too, as, as my son gets a little older and he's trying some new things and I can see the fear holds him back so much. You know, there's, there's maybe like he wants to go out for soccer, but he doesn't know what it's going to be like. And I, I think that that muscle and that courage and in, 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 in heading mm. down those paths is so important, especially for parents to help try to help your kids build that courage muscle and get get after and get a little bit uncomfortable yeah how old's your son he's 10 10 oh yeah perfect so i'm just really curious it, where the x games gold here snowboarder <laughs> i'd love to know what was your process before you would do a run or any of that fear wise how how would you process it yeah a big part of what we did with fear is when we were setting spots up to film, our big thing was we'd, we'd film at these urban spots that were very dangerous, very high risk. Yeah. And a big part of it was getting the spot set up correctly so you could believe and feel that it could happen. So as you're setting the spot up, you're literally working out of fear sometimes of like, wow, well, we're going to hit this spot. I got to fly over this fence and I got to land on oh, this concrete man. wall and I got to ride out over there. And a big part of it is is working working towards the, the goal continuously with the team. I was never out there alone, working with the people I was around, discussing what could be other riders. Hey, what do you see? What are you thinking? And, yeah. and just building the areas that could cause problems, more, more cushion. So if there was a spot, there's always a spot or, in, through one feature. If you were at a one spot, there was a spot where you could get really hurt. And mm. is there a way for us to make that very safe so you could fail there potentially and get up and then do it again you know is there a way to make failing safer and less painful so that you can increase confidence and and get it done i love that you know i had a college professor that came in and wrote on the board like mr hand and rich on high <laughs> he writes on the board he goes the best way to avoid fear is to be so well prepared that there's little chance of failure and it just really stuck with me. I mean, that was what, 30 years ago or something. Yeah, but that's, that's it. Be prepared. That's, that is good. That fear, it, it should drive you. If you use it in a good way, it should motivate you to do good and, and become better. That's the piece. If you can, if you can make that little switch, it pushes you to become better. So, yeah. and your brain changes too. It's like the more you encounter it and process it and deal with fear, it becomes more natural. It becomes easier. And then it's like, you talk about someone with a lot of courage, uh, that took practice. So yeah. I think that's really cool. It did. And the other piece that I think is worth mentioning is that every single 
pro snowboarder I was around when we were filming, every single one of them felt fear. Mm. You think these guys, a lot of times you're like, oh, you have no fear. No, no, that's that. That is 100% incorrect. Everyone, every single person, every single athlete I was around during these times felt major fear, but worked through it and found a way to work through it and continually take baby steps to get past what's ever in front of them. And I think that's, that's of anything in life. I mean, real estate, take baby steps until you feel a little more comfortable and you're still probably going to be a little uncomfortable as you invest. But I mean, the, the other end is keep your money in the bank and let inflation eat it away and have a silent stealer happen. So you've got, you've got to do something in this. Situation. That's the bigger risk. <laughs> yeah, wow. I'm with you there. Um, so, who, who, or what was your biggest inspiration or motivation in in your sports world and business world? You know, today. You know what really changed my life? I grew up. I was diagnosed learning disabled when I was eight. I was put on Ritalin. I put in learning disabled classes. I'm made fun of by the other kids for you know they called me a retard and everything. So for me, I, I had this inner voice, this inner gremlin in my head that told me that I was stupid, that I would never amount to anything, I'd never be successful. And it was actually um, weightlifting that turned things around for me. On uh, my senior year of high school, I started to train with weights. And then so the, the person who most inspired me was Arnold Schwarzenegger, obviously, back then. So his talks, you know, he would talk about having a vision and being committed to that vision and visualizing and all this stuff. So I started to apply those same things and it completely turned my life around. I started to set goals for what I would want it to look like and how much I wanted to lift and all that. And I was like, whoa, this, this process works. And so I applied that to my education and went on to get a degree in um, business from college and all these things started a health club when I was 23. And um, so it really, that was the big turnaround for me. So, I mean, short answer, wow. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a big inspiration in, in the early days for me. Dude, I, I just love that so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you're hearing it right now. I mean, learning disability called a retard in school, made fun of and found some something that was inspirational for him that he liked to do rich here. He working out, setting goals, doing what you say you're going to do totally changed everything mm. about his life. And anyone can do that. Anybody can do that. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't say what everyone's situations in life, but you know, if you've come in from a place of, of being called a retard and not having anything in, in confidence to, to what rich is and who he is now. I mean, I'm looking at you here, rich, and it's just like, man, this guy just is pure confidence and just, you can tell he's a happy guy based on your facial expressions. And I just, very I admire yeah, that. So, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. great. Um, let's see here. Moving on to our kind of our next topics. Um, th there's a lot of fear and doubt when it comes to people's financial future and their goals. What are some strategies to get through those negative times? You know, like you got, let's just say you've got folks right now that are, we're coming into a recession and maybe they're strapped on cash and they're, or they're concerned about their job. They don't have a bunch in savings. What, what, what advice would you give to them to, to, you know, get through and just keep it positive and find a way out of here? Honestly, the most important thing is education, is learning and growing. And you just said something about when you do what you say you will do, you build your confidence. You're so on point with that. Uh, it's an old Latin term, a Latin word that was called confidere. It means with intense trust. So when you do what you say you're going to do, you build intense trust for yourself and your confidence goes up. So I think it's educating yourself, learning, growing, getting around people like you listening to podcasts, getting, you know, connecting with people who have been there, done that, you know, get finding a mentor, all those type of things are the biggest thing that are going to build confidence and then start doing what you say you're going to do. If you say, I'm going to study a half an hour a day and learn about real estate, or if I'm going to read a book a week, uh, or if I'm going to go to X many conferences a year and make this many connections, all those things, when you do what you say you're going to do, your confidence goes up, your knowledge goes up, your financial intelligence goes up and everything starts to change. Gosh, what a great, what a great answer. You guys, I, what, what Rich is talking about right here, I'm working on in my life with a couple of things. I, I said a tw in my 2023 year, I sent my, set my Masogi to do a marathon where I've never run long distances and I'm not sure what the time goal will be, but I'm, I'm going to try to push myself to, you know, a time that I think will be challenging, not just finishing it, but, but what's a time that will, will put some pain throughout the whole year. <laughs> and why, yeah, one of the, things that I've been reading in a book recently was there's a self-starter called do it now. And when you say that in your mind, come hell or high water, whatever you're looking at, you're doing, 
There's no more, mm. more questions, there's mo no more debate. So one of the things I have with getting out of bed is, is I want to be out of bed within five seconds of my alarm. I'm not going to lay there. I want to be up in five seconds. And the first thing I try to remember to do is flash, do it now. And as soon as that thing awesome. hits in my mind, I don't care how I feel. You're getting up, you're going. And I think that that's uh, what, what he's talking about, what, Rich, what you're talking about is just building that trust with yourself. And that's an ongoing process. That's something that doesn't happen overnight. That's day after day after day. And I think you're always going to have different standards of what that is for each person in your life. So I'm so glad you kind of touched on that. It was, it was said very well. And I think that it can touch a lot of people if you, if you guys heard that. Thank you. You know, you it's something about the do it now is awesome. I, I love that. And one thing I've been playing with over this last year is this new thing I just learned. Uh, it, you say that's like me. So when you do it, whatever it might be a good workout, studying, running, you know, getting getting out of bed on time, right? When you do it, you say, that's like me. That's yeah. like me. And if there's something where you mess up, you go, mm, that's not like me. And so you start sending this message to yourself of like, that's like me. I've been playing with that this last year, like after a good workout, especially. And it's it's really cool. It's a really neat message to send to yourself. I love it. Just mentally programming yourself. That's like me. I'm going to adopt that one thing. Yeah, right it's really after good. I kick ass at a workout or do something good, that's like me. Or that's not yeah. like me if I don't like how it was. I love right. it. Exactly. It's like the pat on the back, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted to touch a little bit I, before I forget here. I, I know when you were younger, uh, Kathy said you got sick. And, and I think mm. there was a time in your guys' life you ended up having, and, I, and I'm going to let you talk more about it, but you got sick and Kathy got nervous. And that's really what I think launched your guys' real wealth business. Yeah, Is that exactly. Right? Yeah, that was 2003. Yeah, it was 2002. My book, Extreme Success, came out. I had just signed a book deal with, with Simon & Schuster. I was a keynote speaker. My coaching practice was thriving. Uh, I had this beautiful wife, Kathy, and two daughters, uh, 10 years old and three years old. So I felt on top of my game. I'm like, man, I'm I'm winning. And uh, then I was diagnosed with melanoma, which is the most advanced form of skin cancer, which is not too bad if you get the surgeries and remove it from the skin. Um, but the doctor asked me to get a CT scan to make sure that it hit, hadn't spread and metastasized. And that CT scan showed four masses on my liver. And so I had to wait a couple of weeks for another ultrasound. He wanted me to do that. That showed four masses on my liver. So I had a meeting with an oncologist and the oncologist said, you know, it looks like this is spread to your liver. Melanoma is very aggressive. You probably have about six months to live. And it just rocked our world. I remember driving home from the hospital, just pounding my steering wheel, screaming, tears coming out of my eyes and, you know, all alone, just letting it vent. Um, and I told Kathy, so in those three months of not knowing, um, Kathy's like, what am I going to do to make ends meet? If Rich dies, she was a stay at home mom at the time. And so she started to interview and talk to mentors and find mentors and found out that, you know, when she was talking about making an income, most of these mentors made their money through real estate investing. So that's what turned her on to that. She said, this is what we can do. This is what I'm going to do. And, uh, luckily the doctor's diagnosis was wrong. It's called a false positive. Those masses on my liver were just clusters of blood vessels, blood vessels that a lot of the population has anyway. Uh, so they're harmless, but I had a PET scan and that PET scan showed me hundred percent cancer free, but it was that curse of the three months of not knowing and the tears and the despair. Um, that is what pushed us into real estate investing. And then we just couldn't be stopped after that. And we were hooked. Wow. 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 What a story. That is so crazy. unbelievable, unbelievable. And so inspirational in the sense that, I mean, that Kathy took that fear and just like, okay, I need to do something here and I'm going to find a, a, a way and got after. I'm just curious for you, Rich, those three months or even those two weeks between you needed a scan and you didn't get it. What were some of your biggest lessons that you could share from those, those three months of uncertainty and that kind of an idea that you probably Ooh. had six months to live? Yeah. I mean, the first one that comes up is exactly why we called our company real wealth. And why I explained that earlier is that, you know, working so many hours and thinking that we have forever, that it's so not true. You just never know. Could This could be the last day of your life. So it's like, how do you want to live it? And that's what I was saying to myself. And there was a lot of gratefulness in that time because I had been working with a coach for several years and that coach was drawing the best out of me saying, you know, I was saying, I'm so working so many hours. I feel like I can't catch up. And he challenged me to take Friday off. He said, if you're effective Monday through Thursday, do you have permission to take Friday off? And I'm like, yeah. And he said, what would you do? I'm like, I'd go climbing. 
And he said, okay, let's do it this week. And so I was super focused and effective Monday through Thursday. And then I took that Friday off. I'm like, that was awesome. And I just kept doing it. And now it's, now it's my habit. I, you know, 20 years later, I take my Fridays off as a play day. I've it all blocked off and I go out and do some type of adventure. Um, so from that, because that was a couple of years before that diagnosis, I was like, I'm so glad that I took that time to be with my family, that I stopped working at 5 p.m., that I took time on Fridays to go out and play, that we went on these trips. So there was a gratefulness piece and where if I had not made that shift, I would have had a lot of regrets. I would have been like, man, I got six months to live and now now what? So Gosh. that's the biggest one Gosh. for me. That is that is gold. That I, mean, I don't think you're going to get better advice in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Right there, a man who realizes he's got six months to live and looks back and says, "I'm so grateful for the experience that I got, the time I took off, and having more time to be able to choose to do what I want to do." And uh, that's gold. I love that. Um, mm. in, your, in your experience, what are some traits that you see a successful entrepreneur or a business professional has over the years? leadership, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very much um, captivated by that a great leader. Um, I would say, uh, the best leaders, in my opinion, are the ones who are the most humble, they're confident, and they're humble at the same time. So they don't take the credit, um, they put the credit out, they acknowledge other people for who they are and what they do. Uh, I think that's a huge trait of being a great leader. And, and so I think that's the most important thing is learning how to be a great leader, being humble and doing what you say you're going to do so people can count on you, uh, managing your emotions so you're not yelling at people that you know when you're, you have that stimulus to be able to slow down and take a breath and choose your response. All that stuff I think is absolutely vital to, and because to be a leader, if you really want to be successful financially or anything, um, being a leader and leadership is key because you're going to want people on your team that are going to help you get there. You're just not going to do it on your own. It's just the way it is. That's 100% certain truth right there. What mm. any books or anything that you could give listeners of anything you come across that's helped your leadership skills? Um, extreme ownership was a great one by Jocko Willink. Yeah. Extreme ownership. It really talks about owning everything and not putting blame on on anyone else and is this huge that's a game changer uh any of jim collins work he wrote good to great um he wrote beyond entrepreneurship uh, some of these great books so his stuff is great and then patrick lencioni um has written several amazing parables it's a lot of what turned me on. i love parables too that's why i wrote the wise investor as a parable but patrick lencioni has some really good books that that talk about leadership and kind of taking that to the next level I love it. Yeah. I ask you a question of any book you can think of for leadership and rattles three off and just uh, you can tell <laughs> I'm a little obsessed with this. <laughs> you can tell he, he's a self learner. You guys, I mean, this is, this is the traits of people who I, I see when I'm, we're on these shows, I can tell folks that seem to be just happier or are getting, get living life in a little bit more of the way the path they want to it's, it's self learning. So education, just constant education is, is just, part of what makes, I think people so happy and successful, we, you know, kind of talking a little bit about passion. What are you most passionate about at life at, at this point in your life? Oh, uh, I would number one, it is just what you just said. I'm obsessed with growth, um, becoming a better version of myself. You know, right now I'm version 58.6. So I'm closing in on version 60.0 and a little bit more than a year. So I really think about who do I want to be when I'm 60? Um, fitness wise, agility wise, uh, leadership wise, as a husband, as a dad. So I'm always trying to grow and get better. So I'm, that's my biggest passion is that. And then um, outside of that is adventure sports. I just hooked on them skiing and mountain biking and surfing and, and all that. There's so much, <laughs> so much stuff to do and so little time in, in that sense. To Gosh, just play. Wow. Why are we not hanging out more? I mean, this, <laughs> you and I are, I mean, you're a little older than me, but man, you're speaking my language. This is, mm -hmm. uh, I love it. I love it. Any of your biggest lessons you've learned in your business and or personal life that we haven't touched on that you, you want to add? I mean, the game changer for me that comes up for so many are going through my head, but the game changer for me was curiosity. And it's what I learned from coaching, you know, back in 95, when I went through my coach training certification was, was about a year and a half. And then Kathy went through the same certification 
it was all about being curious and asking powerful questions. And so I found that whether it comes to a business deal, being curious, asking questions is, is going to get you ahead. Um, when it comes to sales, being curious and not going on a monologue is awesome. And I would say most importantly in your relationships, being curious about other people, where they are, you know, it's, it's saved a lot of fights with Kathy and me where I just was like, wait a minute, be curious. What does she need? Do I fully understand her? And that's been the game changer instead of trying to be right. Yeah. Gosh, so good. So good. I, I'm reading this new book right now by Ed Milet called The Power of One More. And read it. <laughs> you did you really? Yeah, it was I great. Mean, it was really yeah, good. Yeah, it's so powerful. He talks about asking more powerful questions. And I, mm. I read that chapter and I'm like, how am I 39? And I've never thought about the quality of the questions I'm asking myself. Never mm. crossed my mind. Awesome. And, and yeah, so I, he has probably 15 questions in that book. And I th sat there and I thought about every single question and I wrote an answer over a week period. And I Good think, you. you know, what you, you just said right there, you just, now my reticular activating system, my RAS this is what Ed talks about in his book is now tuned into it. You know, when you talk about curiosity and asking powerful questions, you start to see similar uh, values and similar characteristics pop up when you start talking to people of success. So that's great. Yeah. What, yeah, as we kind of wrap up the podcast for our, uh, listeners, what are some of your 2023 goals? What are you looking to accomplish? Oh, we are, we just launched uh, another fund at Real Wealth. Uh, it's a single family fund. Uh, so that's one of our big goals is growing that fund because that creates passive income for the investors and also for us. <laughs> so that's a big one on that side of things. Um, that would be kind of the, the professional goal. Um, having the wise investor become a bestseller. Uh, it's been doing really well. It's been solid on, you know, getting up to, you know, the number two spot, but I want it to be number one and I want it to get in a lot of people's hands and touch a lot of lives. So that's a big one. And then, uh, I want to get in the best shape of my life. Honestly, by the time I'm 60, I want to be a lean, agile athlete and strong where I can just, you know, I want to be surfing with my grandkids when I'm 90, you know, I want to be skiing when I'm a hundred and it's like, you know, there's people who are doing it. So I want to do the same. So it's yeah. getting in the best shape of my life. is a big 2023 goal. Awesome. I love that. When you say a wise investor is in the number two spot, where, where do you mean it's the number two spot? How do you, how do you, how do these books rank? I've never written a book. Oh, oh, it's a, just, just on Amazon, uh, in motivation and self-development and then real estate investments. Uh, it's, it's made it up to the number two spot on the bestseller list. Um, so it's like, you get so close and there's one book that's ahead and I'm like, oh, so, you know, getting on a lot of podcasts, sharing the word, getting it out there. And, and the cool thing is now that people are reading it, they're starting to buy it for friends and t talk about it. So I'm, I'm confident that we can get that number one bestseller spot. Well, I love that. I mean, hey, congratulations on number two on Amazon. That's that's yeah, an accomplishment in itself. But let's let's sell some more books for Rich. Clearly, it, it adds <laughs> value. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the number two spot. So, ladies and gentlemen, get a copy of Rich's book. Rich, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been such a great conversation. I really, really admire what you've done and who you are. And Kathy, love you guys. And and, and thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you. And I, I agree with you. Let's hang out. Let's ride together. That sounds good. <laughs>